Lord's never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I'll fill it up, Lord. Come and quench this test of my soul. Bread of heaven, fill me till I want no Special guest of honor, sir, distinguished guest guests, honor, sir. ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy I'm in your midst here tonight. And I don't intend to take a very long time. I'll just share with you what you may probably know and then make a few applications and then we might be able to pray together. In gatherings like this, because it's not really a religious gathering, we may not know the things that God will do, but I've been privileged to be in meetings like this, both in Nigeria and outside Nigeria, and testimonies come in of the great things the Lord has done as a result of simply sharing together and expressing our hearts desires before the Lord. Tonight I want to look at a simple story. And before I look at the simple story, we'll bow our heads in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing and the Lord's anointing on what he wants to share with us tonight, our Father in heaven. We thank you very much. We know you are a good God. We know that nothing happens accidentally in the lives of the people you love in the lives of the people you bless and so we believe that tonight we are not here accidentally we know that we are here on purpose we are asking oh lord you'll speak to our hearts make it simple enough for us to understand real enough for us to appreciate practical enough for us to profit from 
touch everyone touch the mouth of the speaker and the ears of the hearers and do good in the lives of everyone lord we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray i want to speak on the prayer of a wise man many people will be surprised because of the combination of those two things because in our society and looking at what people think and what people say once you are referred to as a wise man accomplished man educated man it's like you have arrived and so you do not have any need the very fact that you are wise fulfilled and you have accomplished something shows that you do not need anyone else and prayer gives a suggestion that you have a need that has not been fulfilled and you and i know when we say somebody is a wise man in quotes is accomplished something is gone through that there has been a measure of self-reliance it's been the captain of a ship and it's been the front liner resolution determination foresight planning strategy has got me to the point where i am and so it's not only that i say i'm wise talking for him the certificates prove that i'm wise because without that wisdom how do i put those little alphabets together and put those numbers together and then shockingly surprised the fellow looking at the combination of those letters and then give me something that we call a certificate obviously the panel the excellent examiners approve that this fellow is a wise man his colleagues also around him they look at him and they envy him because he's climbed the ladder of success and he's got to a place that we are all dreaming to get at and we are thinking and i'm thinking if i could only have a fraction of what he has i'll not be looking for any other thing and the newspapers uh, bring his name out whenever they talk about uh, people that really matter in society and he himself congratulates himself because uh, there no function will really have its goal fulfilled if he is not the master of ceremony there and so you are talking about a person that feels i don't need god i don't need prayer and so why would you then be talking about the prayer of a wise man because i see in the bible a man that many people do not really know that he had been referred to as a wise man before the Lord now said I really want to make you wise to me that's surprising because people had recognized the wisdom of this man when David was dying he was giving instruction to Solomon and then he told him in first Kings chapter 2 verse 9 he was going to give him some instructions and uh, falling back on what David had known about Solomon he used a particular language concerning him and he said Solomon here, here I am I am going now and I'm leaving the kingdom in your hand and he left the kingdom in his hand with the assurance that everything will go well and in first kings chapter 2 verse 9 it says for thou art a wise man and knoweth what thou oughtest to do you are a wise man why do we call him a wise man or why did david call him a wise man he said you know how to make the right decision from a given data he says i call you a wise man because you know how to do what needs to be done there is knowledge there is applied knowledge knowledge itself does not make you wise it is the application of that knowledge to the problem at hand that gives you a solution and when you do that over and over and people can see that you have understanding of applying knowledge to the problems at hand and you always make a success of your decisions then you say that man is a wise man no problem arises that confuses him that he feels i cannot deal with this 
He'll plow through no matter what. He will get through no matter what. And he will give you a decision you can work upon. And whether it's a company or it's a local government or it's a firm or it's an institution, you can depend on what he says and he's going to get results out of it. But now, the Lord came to Solomon. A personal sin now on an individual basis. The father was gone. And then the Lord said unto Solomon, he said, ask what I will do for you. It's like he gave him a blank check. You know that's a very difficult question when somebody comes to you and he says, ask what you want. And he says, just assign my name, whatever you want, fill it in there. It's an embarrassing situation because if you ask for too much, you might be accused of covetousness. If you ask too little, you might be accused of being foolish and ignorant and opportunity. And uh, so, when God asked him, asked what you want, this man decided he'll go this way. Number one, there was adoration. He adored the Lord, appreciated the Lord. He said, Lord, look at all the things you've done for me. Should I even be asking of anything? Looking at the millions of the children of Israel, and looking at the way you have promoted me above them, and I'm to rule over them, and you placed me ahead in the position of my father, David. And that man, David, was a man after God's heart. And you have put me now to step into the shoes of my father. So he adored the Lord. He appreciated the Lord. Before he even asked what he wanted to ask. What a way for us to be able to get to the heart of God. Before we make our prayers, we just adore him. We appreciate him. We say, see the place you have put me. And we do not feel I have got to this place because... I have accomplished it myself. I went to school. I read. I did everything I ought to do. Of course, I merit what I have got. We don't talk like that. In humility, we come in adoration, appreciation of what the Lord has done. Number two, acknowledgement. Knowledge, goodness of the Lord. He said, I didn't put myself here. It's not because the campaign was so great and so high. And so I'm now here. And uh, we put everything together. We had a strategy. We planned everything. And then we went at it with the resolution of a man that could not fail. That's how some of us will talk. That really now I'm in the place where I am because I was so determined and resolute. I was looking at the stars and that was my target and I shot very well because I'm trained for success and now I'm, I'm there but no he acknowledged the goodness of the Lord he said I'm not here because I'm better than others I'm not here because I know what to do I'm here by sheer grace unmerited favor somebody has defined that word grace in two ways Number one, using the letters of the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, it says it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's not something I'm paying for. It's because of the expense at Calvary, the riches of God, the redemption of God, and the resources of God coming from heaven. All of those riches, all of the redemption and the righteousness and the resources of God, all that I get at Christ's expense. Now, somebody defines grace, somebody else, this way. It says yes, that's the beginning. It's initial understanding of the grace of God that you acknowledge that in yourself, because you share in the weakness of man universally, you cannot do anything by yourself, so what you have now, the riches of God, is at Christ's expense. He paid it all. Then, the moment you come into the kingdom, and here is what is applicable also to Solomon, because God said, Solomon, ask what I should do for you. He must have thought. God means what he says, and he only says what he means. That helps in prayer. Because, you know, if somebody just says, I give you a blank check, you say, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't mean what he says. He's a human being. And then you say, when you want to feel that thing, if I feel too much now, he may back up from what he said. 
which will mean then he didn't really say what he meant he meant uh, you know i like to give you a hundred naira but i don't like to tell you the real amount would you feel what you want what can i do for you he may not be saying what he meant but in the case of god he says what he means and he means what he says and so the word grace again now god responds abundantly completely exceedingly that's grace it's grace that makes you to have something so great you didn't dream of that you could have it's grace that makes you to have something so abundant something so complete that when you look at what you have got from the lord you say there is nothing else i can't imagine any other thing i should get from the lord which he has not given unto me and then exceedingly even beyond your wildest dream he gives unto you and so then number one grace is god's riches at christ's expense number two grace means that god responds abundantly completely and exceedingly and now we come to the asking i've talked about the adoration the appreciation i've spoken about the acknowledgement that lord you brought me to this place after he had done those two things after he had appreciated the lord adopt the lord now he acknowledged how good the lord is he was now going to ask the asking and you know the story yourself is found in St. Paul's Kings chapter 3 from verse 5 all through to verse 14. It said, Lord, you know what I'm asking? I'm asking for you to give me wisdom. What a confession. It means then there are levels of wisdom. I think we can divide wisdom up a little bit. That's the kind of wisdom that Satan even has. And this kind of wisdom knows how to bring somebody down. Knows how to bring the crown of creation, Adam and Eve. How to bring them down from the height that God had put them. There is a kind of wisdom that knows how to destroy. There is a kind of wisdom that knows how to destabilize. There is a kind of wisdom that knows how to bring somebody from the top and bring him right to the ground. We say, make him fall from grace to grass. But then there's another kind of wisdom. There is human wisdom. There's a natural wisdom. And in this natural wisdom, there's nothing bad in it, only it falls short of the divine supernatural wisdom. There is nothing wrong with this kind of wisdom. Only it can only achieve things that are earthly, things that are temporal. It will not carry you beyond the stars. It will not carry you beyond the realm of the human. So there is human wisdom. And you'll find that there are people that don't read the Bible, they don't pray, they don't depend upon God. But God has created us with some gifts with some talents, with some possibilities within us. And uh, if you will dig that thing out and make use of it just with human wisdom, you can go farther than the rest of the people that don't know that it's anything they call wisdom. And yet, God has made us in such a way that until you come to know him, until you come to talk to him, he reserves something to himself so that every human being at the end of his journey, he will look back, he would say, had I known that there is still another level of wisdom, I would have gone to the creator of the heavens and earth and it will add that pitch. So that every human being at the end of his journey, he will look back, he would say, had I known that there is still another level of wisdom, I would have gone to the creator of the heavens and earth and it will add that bit, that bit that is supernatural unto the earthly human natural thing that I had and I would have gone beyond the place I got to. So there is also spiritual wisdom. When you walk with Christ, so to say, day by day, you read about the life of Christ. That bit that is supernatural unto the earthly human natural sin that I had and I would have gone beyond the place I got to. So there is also spiritual wisdom. 
when you walk with Christ, so to say, day by day, you read about the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ, the way he handled problems, the way he dealt with people. And you just say, all I want is to do it the way Christ did it. And you give your life to him, you come into partnership with Christ. And it's like you are married together spiritually. You are linked together. What he has belongs to you, who you are belongs to him. And then he props up, he props up your weakness. Then he says, where you are weak, I will strengthen you. When you come into relationship, partnership with Christ like that, a kind of wisdom is transferred unto you. Because he says himself, here is someone greater, wiser than Solomon. And then, as we begin to read, there is a kind of wisdom to you. We we'll call it the gift of the word of wisdom. That now comes to you through the spirit of God. And now, Solomon told the Lord, this is what you will ask for. He said, Lord, see the place you have put me. Have some wisdom. I've been looking at my father David. I saw the way he counseled. I saw the way he helped the people. I even saw the way, I've read about the way I wasn't born then, the way he defeated Goliath. And I've seen the way he dealt with the Philistines. I've seen a lot of things, therefore I've gathered something of wisdom since I was born. But could you give me a kind of wisdom beyond that which my father David had? So that all these thousands of people and millions of people when I am leading them, counseling them, and judging them, there will be that bit that is supernatural, that goes beyond the natural earthly thing I've learned. Then I'll be able to apply that on top of what I got from my father. And that's what the Lord wants to do for you. We've got some wisdom already. We passed through the educational system. And just listening to my teachers at school, I've got some wisdom. And just listening to my parents, the way they solve the day-to-day -day problems, I would able, I'll be able to now say, this is how my father and all that thing, that's how my mother and all that thing. And as I've read in the papers and I've read the biographies of other people too, there's a natural kind of wisdom you get from that. And you will say that this is the way, you know, what you read about Abraham Lincoln, about Winston Churchill, and what you read about Napoleon, and what you read about this and about that. And some other people in the country here that you appreciate, that you have appreciated, this is what you read about them. But you will need to go a little bit beyond the natural thing that you have got. And so the Lord was so happy with his request, with what he asked. Now let me ask you, if uh, you were in Solomon's situation, and what came to him came to you, how would you have responded to show the kind of wisdom that you have? Now because you've read it in the Bible, you may not understand how significant, how deep and rich that was. But I'm going to ask you another question and see how you will respond. Who suppose you have real flower? And suppose you also have on the other side a kind of a flower, but which is, you know, plastic. And you know, these uh, a plastic industry now, they do some of these things that you look at it, you cannot tell the difference between the real flower and the uh, one that they just made out of science. And uh, now they say, don't get near, just stay here and point at the real one. How would you have done that? Difficult. The way Solomon would have done that is to open the door, allow the flies and the bees, insects to come in, and the insects will go to the natural flower. And when Solomon sees that, Solomon will say, that's the natural one. How do you know? Because the plastic one is not going to attract any insect. You understand? Now, come back to the wisdom of Solomon. The wisdom of Solomon, uh, two women slept together. One slept on her child, and they woke up in the morning. One was a dead child, and the other one was a living child. And so, the first woman said, that's my child. The second woman said, that's my child. And now Solomon needed to say who the real mother was. And if he checked up in his notes, all that he learned in organization, political science, administration, he wouldn't find any answer. And if he checked up on the biographies he had read, he wouldn't find any answer. 
if you found out how David did it, that case did not come before David. But now there is an extra that Solomon had got the wisdom from above. And so he said, uh, one of your servants, can you give me a sword there? And uh, he said, what I'm going to do, if I cut this living child into half, into two, and then the dead child, if you want, you can cut that into two. I give you half of the dead, half of the living. And they give you half of the dead, half of the living, half plus half makes one, but dead one. Then you go home. The one that is not the real mother said, Solomon, that's exactly what you are going to do. You are going to cut that living child into two. Give me half, I carry home and go and do whatever I want. Give her half, it will not belong to anyone. And the real mother said, Solomon, don't do that. Give the child to this person. When the child grows up, will be able to know how things will be. Don't touch the life of the child. And Solomon said, don't you see everybody? This is the real mother. At that time, there was no blood test. And what could you do at that time? No blood test, nothing you could do in that area. And so he got the wisdom that now everybody knew that this person will receive something from God. And what I'm telling you tonight is that you can receive something here tonight from the Lord. Everybody that had known you before that you were successful, they will know there is an extra that came into your life. And they will know you got something here tonight. Do you know you can get something here tonight? And so, baby, uh, Solomon rather, he got, that's my last point now, the answer from the Lord. We started from the word adoration, appreciation. And then we came to the word acknowledgement of the goodness of the Lord. And then we came to the asking. He asked from the Lord what he wanted. And now we have the answer that the Lord gave unto him. And the Lord said, because you have asked something that pleased me. That shows us something, a secret about prayer. When you ask for something that pleases the Lord, then it says, I will give you what you are asking, and I will give you more than what you are asking. And uh, God has not changed. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you will ask from the Lord tonight, what pleases the Lord? He will give you what you are asking. He will give you much more than what you are asking. He still answers prayer. And just coming from Portacourt, I came yesterday, and in Portacourt we saw quite, we saw quite a lot of things. And um, I go to a number of places, and by the grace of God, I hand over the meeting to the Lord, and I preach like I've done now, and then I pray. And we don't need to multiply words when we are praying. We just tell the Lord, Lord, this is what you said in your word. Please do it. And uh, we don't need any gymnastics. We don't need to sweat. Because even if we shouted on top of our voices, God is so far away in heaven, they may not even hear you at the stadium if you are shouting here. And so that's why we don't have to shout. We just tell the Lord because he is here with us. And he can hear the most quiet whisper. And if you will tell the Lord and say, Lord, here is what I want you to do for me. If that prayer pleases him, that's the condition. If that prayer pleases him, it's going to give you what you have asked, and it's going to even add more to what you have asked. I was talking about Portacot. I gave them the word, and after giving them the word, then we pray the prayer that I knew will please God anytime, anywhere. And I said we're going to, if you have any sin in your life, things that do not please the Lord, just confess it to the Lord, get rid of it, and say, Lord, forgive me and cleanse me. I knew that will please the Lord. Because that's why he sent Jesus Christ. He will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And I know whenever I start like that, and the people are sincere, and they confess their sins to the Lord, and say, Lord, we're sorry for what we have done, and they are not proud, saying, we've been church God says we are done. What, you talk, what are you saying about confessing sin? When they did that, then I told them, now that you have done that which pleases the Lord, we're going to now ask anything from the Lord. I didn't even know there was a child there 13 years of age having a big mountain on the back we call hunchback and I just simply said oh Lord move in the midst of the people those who are blind open their eyes those who are lame make them to walk if they have any swelling whether go at our hunchback remove it and then the people said amen we opened our eyes and the people began to shout because that girl the Lord had removed the hunchback 
and uh, is still able to do that today. And then we, as the testimony continued, one woman marched out and said, how many years she had been blind in both eyes, and both eyes had opened. Yeah. And then another one, a very important uh, man, a dignitary in society, said he had been lame for many, many years, and now he walked up. In fact, when I saw him, I wanted to ask again, did he say he was lame? Because he walked like you and I will walk, as if nothing had happened to him. The Lord is still walking today. The secret is you will ask what pleases the Lord. Yeah. And you ask what pleases the Lord. You look at your life, and if there's anything you feel, there may be a comma in this. God may not appreciate this. He may not appreciate that I've done this, I've done this against him. So you come before the Lord, you say, Lord, I'm not even worthy to ask anything from you. All I'm asking is, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and take away this sin. When you talk like that, God looks at you and says, There are still human beings that are still humble, that will not say they are right, and they will confess like this. He will forgive you. He says, Don't go yet. What else do you need in your family? You need a child in your family, he'll give you a child. You need deliverance, he'll give you deliverance. Any other thing you need, he'll give you because you asked for something that pleased him. That's what we are going to do now. We're going to pray. Would you like to pray? You will ask what you know will please the Lord. You look at your life very quietly and you just say, Lord, I give myself to you. I'm sorry for anything wrong that I've done. After that prayer, then every other thing he will do unto us. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Just between you and the Lord quietly. You will be humble before the Almighty God. And say, Lord, you know I have not lived a perfect life. Yes, I know I've sinned. Yes, Lord, I remember this, I remember this, I remember that. I feel so guilty and condemned about it. Please, please, please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for me to take away my sins. I acknowledge that you are a good God. What a pardoning, merciful God, forgiving God we have. And I thank you because I believe my sins are now forgiven by your grace. I have God's righteousness at Christ's expense. In Jesus' name we pray. Please keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed if you don't mind. I want to pray with you on that first request. And if you are interested in us praying together on that request, that God Himself Almighty will forgive all the sins you have committed since you were born because He's able to do it. You just please quietly raise up your hand and I'll pray with you. Just between you and God. Thank you. Just quietly raise up your hand. You are taking a step that pleases the Lord. It's not religion. It's not calling you to a denomination. It's just praying a prayer that pleases God. As you raise up your hand, Look at that raising up of the hand as surrender to the Lord. It's like when a child wants the mother to carry her. And she raises up the hand as a symbol, signal that the mother should carry her. You are saying, Lord, carry me now. Take all my, all my blame, all my guilt, all my condemnation. Take me up. Make me yours from now on. And he does it. He never fails. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time. I praise your name for the hands that are raised up. And I pray, Lord, according to your mercy, forgive them all their sins in Jesus' name. Cleanse them with the blood of Jesus Christ. Let there be a definite change, definite transformation. Grant them, Lord, the grace to live to please you more and more. I pray that you grant them assurance in them that because they have asked what pleases you. You have also answered their prayer. 
and you have accepted them as belonging to you. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now I'm going to also pray if you have any need in your life. Uh, the way I want to do this is that we look at something definite, a definite problem. I don't want us when we pray not to know when the answer comes. If you had a medical problem that the doctors had spoken about or maybe even checked you up and you have either an x-ray or something, as we're going to pray now, you will go back to the doctor when you have a chance after this prayer. Maybe not today, but perhaps this week or next week. And let him check you all over again. He will confirm that the Lord has healed you. He will confirm you are healed. And then you will tell him it's the Lord who has done it. Do you believe that can happen? And if you have any problem in the family, any problem, any problem you think about, maybe in your place of work, we just bring you definitely to the Lord. And I believe that he's going to so answer that you will see the definite change. Even people around you will know that something definite has happened. If you're married and there is no child, would you allow me to be bold and to tell you that we're going to pray here today. And I don't know which church you go, in your church, wherever you are, you will be able to give testimony that we were there in that meeting. We thought it was just a social gathering, but see what the Lord has done for me. He will give you your own baby in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes as we pray now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. We know that you are a very good God, compassionate, merciful God. You are a God that answers prayer. We acknowledge the very fact that you are the one that has brought us to the level in which we are now. Yet, we need something extra from you. I'm asking for anyone that has any sickness here. I'm asking you, Lord, you will touch that individual in a very definite manner. Heal him, heal her in Jesus' name. I pray for those who are dying and they're looking up to you for children. I pray there will be a definite touch from above. And whatever is wrong with the husband, whatever is wrong with the wife, take that thing away, O oh Lord. Give them children, living children in Jesus' name. For women who have been having miscarriages upon miscarriages, I pray that you cancel that miscarriage in Jesus' name. Uh, for someone that has the problem in the brain, I see if uh, not clearly mental, but uh, going in that direction, I rebuke that spirit now. Come out in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for the one that has the asthma, and I'm asking that you will touch that individual now instantaneously and permanently. Remove that asthma in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, I pray that anyone that has any pain, any sickness, you are the great God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I pray that you manifest your power upon them and you will heal them completely in Jesus' name. In their places of work, I pray that if there is any problem they are trying to resolve and they ask them for that bit of wisdom to bring a solution to that problem. I'm asking that you show them the light through the tunnel in Jesus' name. So that, Lord, that terrible problem, that terrible problem, we remove it in Jesus' name. Family problem, remove them in Jesus' name. And I pray that as a result of gathering here together today, as a result of praying a prayer that pleases you today, we do something for everyone here, that each one will realize God did this in my life. Give everyone, Lord, peace of mind. Thank you because we know you have answered. I will testify to the glory of you. my family um thank you so much pastor dada he has been a father to me i don't start crying okay um i remember i came here without um scholarship to harvard university the first year wasn't easy but i got a grant that paid half of my tuition but then from second year i got like five different scholarships from my department i just thank god third year the same thing and i thank god because i'll be graduating in may i didn't have